G'day guys, today we're going to have a look at why did the Viking raids begin all the way back when in the 8th century AD. Let's take a look. Alrighty everyone, so there's a whole range of different theories out there, some of them way too simplistic around why the Viking raids began. Some people blame particular individuals and other people blame environmental and geographical uh, impacts that occurred throughout the time period. I'd really like to go back and have a bit of a look and sort of explore this. I think this is a really fascinating subject uh, because Without the Viking raids, I, I think so much um, social and political evolution would simply never have taken place. I think it would be a lot of military evolution that never took place. So really fascinating stuff. Let's take a look. One of the first theories that tends to come up when we talk about Viking raids uh, is overpopulation. This was in fact a theory that it was popularized by contemporary Christian monks at the time. There is a slight difference here. This is a bit more complex than people might realize. Uh, are we talking population density or are we actually talking population numbers? And I think this is a little bit more uh, to it. There is archaeological evidence to support this in terms of deforestation and new settlements, but these occurred largely after the raids really began. So I don't think that population numbers or even population density are the specific cause of the raids. However, linked with population comes another theory which I think does have a little tiny bit of credibility to it and that is chromosome imbalance. There's a theory that uh, environmental factors such as temperature uh, affected the chromosomes the theory goes that with more boys being born, then there would have been fewer women and that would have led to um, raiding in order to seek out uh, wives to have. Now, this is kind of supported with some of the... More recently, you can in fact see the kind of, uh, the kind of impact this can have through the China One Child Policy. That is to say that boys were favoured and girls seem to drop off the radar a bit. Um, it's, it's possible that because of the way that children were raised in Viking society that girls sort of had less value in some respects or perceived value and therefore um, they were sometimes left out in the cold to essentially die. Um, no, we don't know how common that was or not. Um, but there certainly does seem to be some reports of that kind of thing occurring. Uh, I, I, I think there's a little bit of evidence here and I think this could have a contribution to the rating. Um, but I don't think it certainly would have been the cause of rating. Radio. So, by bringing that together a bit, uh, let's take a look at marriage. So, in traditional... Uh, Germanic marriages of the time period, it was customary for the bride's family to pay the husband's family a dowry and the husband's family to pay the bride's family a dowry. Many of these Germanic tribes were very poor at the time. This was just common. And so a lack of money may well have a lot to do with this. We'll nut this out a little bit more as we go through. And, and certainly if you think that a bigger family, that is to say that if, if someone's having, you know, five, six, eight children or whatever, then the bigger dowry payments will be made to the earlier children who reach marital age 
than trying to save money for children who may not survive that long. And so, and, and so those children, the younger children, would simply not have the money to get married. And there's a possible impacts here. So when we go back to the, the DNA aspect to this, we can see that the male DNA in Scandinavia does seem to have remained, relatively speaking, consistent. Whereas the, f the female DNA, that is the mitochondrial DNA, does seem to have a strong influence from uh, so-called Celts. Now this is a little bit problematic because um, it really does depend on your definition of Celt and it does depend on um, how that has been evolved over time and the reliability of mitochondrial evidence given the fact that some of this happened over a thousand years ago. Um, however, based on the evidence that does seem to have been collected by science, there is some um, substance to this. So what this is saying is that it does seem to be proven through DNA that um, women were brought into Scandinavia as wives. Radio, the next big one is the French factor um, or, or Frankish influence. I use French and I use Frankish as sort of generic terms here. Um, let's take a little bit of a look at this. In the 8th century, we see substantial efforts by the Frankish Empire to expand and solidify and consolidate their borders. This was during the time of King Gorm of Denmark. Around about the time of 800 AD, Denmark builds an extensive system of fortifications, of garrisons, of walls and defensive structures um, around its borders uh, to protect itself from internal problems. Now, let's just think about this. Um, this is trying to defend Denmark against uh, external influences. So raiding in from, as I say, not only the Franks, but from other areas as well. We're going to go into this a bit more as we get into the video. This is really significant because I think it's fair to say that the raids wouldn't have simply started because the Vikings, sorry, the so-called Viking raids, I don't believe just simply started as a result of um, building a load of defensive infrastructure. So let's just take a bit more of a look at this. Um, I think probably um, one of the biggest influencing factors is the growing unification of Denmark and Norway and the growing sort of unification and centralization of political structures though um, yaldums and earldoms and sort of um, a system of governance that uh, and a recognition of borders which was much more profound at this time than it had been earlier on had it been this profound earlier on because of a lack of ability from these tribes to defend themselves on a larger scale. You also have to understand that armies at this time were relatively small, in fact incredibly small. Um, armies at this time may have only been sort of 60 or 120, uh, that is, you know, based on the number of boatloads. Each boat, roughly speaking, took around about 50, 60 warriors, therefore you could possibly say that maybe an army of, of um, at largest would have been somewhere in the region of four to six boats. So even that's only 300 or so. And that would have been a considerably rare event. Most likely you'd raid with one or two ships. Um, so as the, the centralization starts to occur, money starts to be coined and distributed and trading networks are solidified and consolidated, then you start to see the ability to um, economics. Here is a massive one. Now we've already touched on this already. Not only in terms of the ability to get married, but I think we're also talking about the ability for, for people and societies and communities to function. So many of these people, particularly Scandinavians, were artisans, crafters, blacksmiths, builders, all of that kind of thing. 
and to trade their goods, to sell their goods on a wider scale, they needed trading networks. As the Frankish Empire grew and Charlemagne was seeking, um, I guess, recognition from the Pope, uh, he pushed the, the um, Christian message and solidified a lot of Christianity. Now, this isn't so much a religious aspect, but more about being able to control trade. Modern countries today control trade through quarantine uh, and customs and excise and all of those kind of border control measures. This was simply being able to uh, communicate that control measure. And what happened around this sort of time period was that Christian traders were basically told to only trade with Christians, not Muslims, and not heathens, not pagans. So there was a, a big aspect here of the Frankish people refusing to trade um, with the Scandinavians, which therefore largely um, restricted the ability of the Scandinavians to trade and to function as a society and an economy. This would in large part explain why much of the Frankish territory and Frankish coastline was such a target during the earlier phases of the so-called Viking raids. Climate change. And this is significant. Um, there was a mini ice age in the very, very early stages here, around about the years of 535 and 536. Um, now, this would have caused uh, large periods of darkness. This would have caused a uh, restricted amount of growth of crops. It would have reduced the amount of wildlife to hunt. It would have reduced the ability to fish. It would have reduced the ability um, to trade and to be able to even work between communities. Um, so this would have placed massive, massive, massive pressures on uh, individuals and also communities. Um, and I think this probably would have been uh, a, a significant factor. Food shortages tend to lead to social problems, social unrest and civil unrest. Um, all big factors here. Now I think there's some, some big influencing around the raids starting to come out. Under Danish and Germanic laws, that under particular crimes, uh, a person could be declared an outlaw. That is to say they are outside the law. That is to say that um, they are no longer protected by the law. And as a result, um, they could be killed by anyone without any form of consequence. So these sort of people, it's quite feasible to say, would have started to collect together and it's quite reasonable to believe that some of these people may have in fact started to um, bring together some of the skills and abilities and started to raid because they're already outlaws, they've got nothing left to lose um, and if you can't earn an income within society then sometimes um, it could be seen that you'd need to take an income from, from society itself. Under the economic kind of issue you also, as I've previously talked about, had the inheritance issue. So the more children that someone had um, because there was a very high infant mortality rate at this time, not just through environmental factors, but through disease, the lack of medications, and all of that, those kind of factors come together. So you're going to give your inheritance to the older children, uh, and that was basically um, how things were done in, in the Germanic sort of area, uh, eras. So it would have meant that some children would simply miss out on inheritances. And that could be a massive factor, uh, this kind of social um, and financial deprivation leading to a sense of... Um... There's another factor here which I think needs to be discussed. Christophobia, that is to say, basically a fear or 
um, a hatred basically the, towards Christians by the pagans and, and the heathens. I don't believe that's actually true at all. Um, there's very, very, very strong evidence to say that right throughout the so-called Viking Age, uh, many of these Scandinavians were trading with monasteries and abbeys and minsters. Um, they were trading goods. Now, there's quite important here. So, a lot of these um, these minsters and abbeys and, and nunneries and so on would have relied very heavily on farmers for uh, sheep fat and that kind of thing, which they would use to make candles. Um, and so life within these monasteries would have actually depended very significantly um, on trade because whilst they were self-sufficient to a large degree uh, they also needed um, a degree of trade to provide them with a lot of other provisions the Norse uh, that the Scandinavians I believe would have had a very good understanding of this they had very well established trading networks that in fact dated back to the classical period with the Romans uh, and therefore it, quite feasible that the um, that these Scandinavians would have been able to provide the uh, these monks and these abbeys and these cathedrals and so on uh, with these tradable goods. So I don't believe there was a fear of Christians and I actually want to expand a little bit more on this later. The invention of the longship. Right. We know in fact that the Scandinavians used a variety of classes of ship. Um, and these different ships had different purposes. Some were designed more so for trading, some were more designed for raiding. Did these ships bring about the Viking Age? No, I actually don't believe so. Um, necessity, they say, is the mother of invention and function, uh, form follows function. Therefore, it's, it's to say that um, these ships evolved, uh, I guess, because of the raids. But they also, these ships also would have facilitated the raids. That is to say that once shipbuilding became um, a more refined kind of art form, if you like, then and a better understood process, then raiding became much more of a, of a um, frequent kind of occupation for many of the Scandinavians. It's very important to understand though that raiding wasn't the be-all and end-all for many Scandinavians. There were indeed um, a core element of essentially professional raiders. But that said, um, not all Scandinavians were Vikings by any stretch of the imagination. Most would have been farmers, traders, merchants, artisans, carpenters, blacksmiths, and so on and so on and so on. Um, the actual raiding and the war part of it, uh, I don't believe was really even um, a major element of the lifeline of uh, many Scandinavians. The discovery of new lands, did that bring about the so-called Viking Age? Um, no, I don't believe so because we've already talked about the ships being evolved from the Viking raids and trading. So um, those ships would have helped facilitate and, and the better designer ships and the evolution of ship design would have been able to facilitate the discovery of those new lands uh, and the epic voyages undertaken by Vikings such as Bjorn Ironside and Eric the Red and so, so many, many more. In fact, if we look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the year 787, uh, we can see that uh, Vikings were already trying to raid into uh, the lands of King Offa. We'll talk about King Offa himself in another video, probably uh, in a few weeks' time. What about weak European leaders? Oh, goodness me. There were indeed uh, weak European leaders, and there were indeed uh, the, the fractured society that Europe had become uh, did indeed create the opportunity for the Vikings. Um, there was a lot of political and social instability throughout Europe throughout these times. 
But there were also magnificent leaders within that time period too. King Offa being one, King Charlemagne being a second, uh, Alfred the Great being a third, and again, many, many more. Um, many leaders rose to the challenge and many leaders were able to lead incredibly effectively. So I don't believe that um, a lack of leadership resulted in uh, the Viking raids at all, no. Vikings were, however, very strategic. They were very uh, opportunistic and very tactful. They had a real understanding of the word opportunity. That is to say that uh, through their trading with the monasteries and the abbeys and the minsters and so on, I believe the, uh, the Vikings would have recognized um, opportunity for raiding. Uh, I think I'll be doing a video on the Linders Farm raid probably in a week or two. I think I'd really like to pull that apart uh, then. That is to say, however, that the Vikings absolutely knew there were lands to the west. They also knew there were lands to the east. The, the Norwegians had already expanded by this stage. We're talking the early 8th century. The the Vikings had already pushed into um, continental Europe, they'd already pushed into um, what is today the sort of Russian Empire and so on, and they were expanding and trading and working their way through many of these areas already. King Charlemagne. Uh, I've heard this a lot, actually. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, in October of 782, Charlemagne orders the execution of four and a half thousand pagan Saxons. This is highly significant. On the surface, uh, it's very easy to, I guess, bring about an association here. 782 was only 11 years before the raid on Linda's farm, and it's fair to say that word of this uh, massacre at Verdun would have gotten around through trading networks and so on throughout the sort of uh, Danish and Norwegian territories and um, there would have been a, a great deal of emotional feeling around this. I just want to uh, look at a couple of facts though about Charlemagne. Charlemagne became King of the Franks in 768 and then King of the Lombards in 774, and it was then declared Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800 AD. However, did this event bring about the raid on Linda's farm? I, I don't think so. There had already been um, there had already been a great deal of um, pressure that was partly political and partly social and partly cultural and partly religious. Um, had been forming, if you like, uh, against heathens, and that is to say non-Christians, not specifically heathens in terms of the heathen religion. Um, so I'm talking about um, the Christian church pushing for trading restrictions against non-Christians. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the the impact of that then would have led to um, financial restrictions because the Norse and the Danish were no longer able to trade as freely and as frequently uh, as they had been previously. Uh, that would have led to, I guess, um, a lot of the, the social sort of and economic problems that we've already talked about. So things like um, the lack of ability to give inheritance and consequently the lack of ability for some people to get married uh, and start their own lives. So I think there's some, some big issues here. I don't think that's specifically a religious issue, nor do I think it's exclusively a social or cultural issue um, but this was about kind of um, being able to control trade and being able to control and enforce borders right so when we talk about uh, about this I just want to sort of um, interject a little with a few issues around um, Christianization the pagans themselves have never 
essentially done a holy war. Um, and I don't think that, that any religion can really spread faith by hate. Um, I think that we can all see that that's, relatively speaking, self-destructive. I don't believe pagans uh, are led by blind faith. That is to say that um, just because one pagan wants to do something, it doesn't mean all pagans need to do it. And I think paganism is, is really about quality um, versus quantity. Alrighty, so let's just expand a little. If we just focus on Denmark a little bit here, you can see that in the year 720, Denmark created a massive canal defensive system. That's highly significant because they were obviously preparing defenses against raids, potentially sea, like obviously seaborne raids, um, and fairly extensive ones as well. There was a massive Danish military base constructed around the year 734, and in 737, the Danes built uh, the, I'm gonna get my pronunciation wrong here, the Verki Wall, I'm apologising if I get uh, if I've got that pronunciation wrong. Uh, it, it is very important to understand, though, that the Danes themselves were already facing massive, massive, massive pressures. So, from the west, the Danes were being raided by the Saxons. And this goes right back into the very, very early eighth century, and this goes—that is to say, the very early 700s. From the north. The Danes were being um, raided by the Geats, Swedes, the Norwegians, and to the west, the Sorbins. So this was all happening 50 years before Charlemagne. And the Danes, uh, I guess, would have learnt through, um, through military experience, um, and they, they would have learnt... Um, the, the impact of uh, these kind of shock raids that happened. I guess, um, I guess what I'm wanting to say is that there wasn't no sort of single factor here which really led to the, um, I guess what I'm trying to say, there was no single factor that led to uh, the, the Viking raids and there certainly wasn't uh, any kind of simplistic reason. There's a lot of very complex social, political, uh, and cultural and religious reasons um, and a lot of it comes down to economics. It's important also to say that in the 6th century AD, uh, that is really around the late 500s, the Anglo-Saxons in England seem to have discovered some fairly large uh, deposits of silver in their lands. This allowed them to mint massive amounts of coins and you can see this very clearly um, because a lot of this silver uh, is, is, is within what's taken by the, um, by the Danes and Norwegian Viking raiders and has ended up in, in, in museums uh, in Denmark and Norway. Righto guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.